Varsågod. Tack. Som sagt, eh, ni får gärna ställa frågor på svenska. Arbetsspråket är väl engelska, så det blir mycket trevligt för mig och för er att följa mig på engelska. All right. So we go to English. And uh, Svante already started to do some stretching exercise. I want to continue for one minute more. And just to get us started, how many of you have heard the word magnetism before? Yeah. Good. I'm happy that <laughs> that was what I was expecting. And how many of you have ever played with a magnet? Very good. Okay, good. So far, so good. And if I now ask you, how many of you know the fundamental reason why magnets repel or attract each other? Yeah, it gets, <laughs> it gets a bit harder here. And then if I ask you, how many of you know that actually magnets are used every day? Uh, to store basically all, almost all of the information we have in the internet, to store basically everything we know. Uh, a bit more. But this is not unusual. This is actually uh, uh, the typical uh, experience one has when you talk about magnetism. Everyone knows, everyone has heard about magnetism, but what exactly is? There is a kind of a magic behind it, a kind of a mystery. And this is actually, it also reflects the way humanity or civilization has learned about magnetism. Magnetism was one of the very first, uh, uh, let's say, effects, physical phenomena that was observed. And it took 2,500 years to actually explain it. I think it's the physical phenomenon that has the longest span between the discovery and the explanation. And so we basically played around <laughs> with magnetism for 2,500 years. And then the last 100 years, we start to understand it. So uh, why should you care about magnetism? And uh, most of you maybe knows that magnets are used to, for compasses. And you can say, oh, yes, if you navigate, if you have a boat or a plane, that could be useful. And uh, some of you can say, well, but we have GPS, which are much better than now. And uh, you may be right. Uh, on the other hand, if your battery goes down and if there is a very thick clouds, then you still want a magnet in your boat. And that's why still all planes and all, mag uh, all boats I still carry a, a normal magnetic compass in it. But this is actually a very little use of magnetism. The biggest use we have actually in, uh, in the, the real world in, in producing electricity. All electricity in the world is almost all, I would say, is produced using some sort of magnet. So the fact that we are here, that we have light, is because there is a magnet somewhere which is helping the creation of electric uh, currents. And we will see in this lecture a bit how it works. Uh, we actually... Most, almost, I would say, all wireless communication relies on magnets. It's, uh, it's the, this, maybe the younger, the, among the youngest of you, we don't know what this is, this is a radio, a very old one. Uh, but uh, if you look at a mobile phone, it's also a Wi-Fi device. And in order to tune the frequency to make it work, usually you have a little magnet that controls uh, the frequency of your phone. And this is the probably the most technologically challenging, this one that arrived last, is that we store information in forms of one and zeros. This is the digital information. And these one and zeros are magnets, very tiny magnets, point either up with the north up or with the north down. We'll also go through this uh, later on. So this is a bit, I would say this is very fascinating and a bit mind-boggling that magnet is actually, it's a bit everywhere. And this actually fascinated also many artists, and some in particular, I cite one, one only, only tonight is, as a cartoonist, is Chester Gould, uh, which was the creator of Dick Tracy, which once said that the nation that controls magnetism will control the universe. It was a bit maybe uh, <laughs> exaggerated, but he did, in one of these uh, uh, comic strips that he wrote, he actually invented the magnetic air cars. Uh, this was used by apparently police to chase thieves. And I know, uh, don't ask me what these antennas are, apparently uh, to control these magnetic cars that can levitate, and you think, okay, this is very naive and impossible. But then if you think that in Shanghai there is a maglev that goes almost at 500 kilometers per hour, then maybe this idea wasn't too far off, and this came 50 years later. So there is actually, even the imagination of artists actually has maybe predicted some of the uh, fascinating uh, things that you can do in magnetism. Okay, so what we're gonna, going to do tonight is we do a kind of a time travel, and very quick, of course, we don't have that much time, but we go basically through the uh, years to the human history with the eyes of magnetism. And we try to understand how uh, people have used and, and learned about magnetism. And uh, I would say that there are mainly three important periods in human history. 
Uh, the first is the ancient medieval, medieval times where we actually basically, we just noticed that something was magnetic. We didn't know uh, very much about it. We use it for navigation, uh, as we will see. Uh, but it was very, uh, very little done. And then we went to the Enlightenment age. The Enlightenment actually was around here, so this is a very broad definition of Enlightenment. And then uh, we go through the, uh, the, our, our times, the last, the 20th century and the 21st, where we actually understood and used magnets really at its, probably at its best. And uh, so the, uh, so one, one thing that I want to tell you, so we will start with this, uh, w with this part where we have compasses and we use nav magnets to navigate. I just want to give a word of caution. So I think most of you will be able to follow me for the first 2,500 years. Once we get here, it gets very complicated very quickly. So it's, uh, uh, many people don't discuss when they discuss about magnetism. Many clever people avoid this. I, maybe I'm not that clever. I decided to, to give it a try, and we'll see how it goes. Even if you don't get it uh, exactly, well, uh, try to get, uh, get an idea for the ideas that people come up with. And if you really want to know more, and well, come and study physics here with us, and uh, you will be able to do that. All right, so we start from the ancient times. Uh, the first report of, uh, reports of magnetism were in Greece. And uh, is, they say the year is about 650 before Christ. And it was the discovery of lodestones, uh, something that looked like this, well, like in this in the paper, but some black stones that now we know is called magnetite. Uh, and they, someone noticed that these stones tend to attract each other, and they, they, so they were moving. And uh, the, the, the place where they were discovered is magnesia, is what is believed gives the name to magnetism. And the, um, the first person that started to give an interpretation was Thales, uh, Thales of Miletus. And if he gave a, a very interesting uh, explanation, he thought, so, you could see some magnetic stones like this, and when there was, especially in some conditions, if you were kicking around or if there was also a lightning coming up, you could see the, the stones moving. And you can understand that in the mind of an ancient person, uh, something that moves is something that is alive. Right? So people thought that actually there was a life in magnets, that they had a soul. And this was very esoteric, but that's the way you could think at the time. So something is moving, there must be something that makes it moving. And uh, uh, it's, uh, something similar was also uh, thought in, in China, where actually pretty early people actually were able to, to build something that is similar to what we call now a compass. This looks like a, a spoon. And in China, they were using this for something called Feng Shui. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it. This is a practice where you think you find, you believe that you find harmony with the universe by aligning things, aligning objects. And this was the, the things that you use as a reference where you align uh, stuff. Okay, and uh, for practical reasons uh, that you may ask me if, you, if you're interested afterwards, it took actually quite a lot of time before actually people could take a magnet on a boat and use it for navigation. And uh, so first were the Chinese and then the Europeans. Uh, it, it seems like the Chinese compass pointed south and the European pointed north. And at some point, one, someone decided north was the standard one. Uh, but it, still, it was the same idea. And of course, as soon the, uh, as soon as this thing started to work and be used, people asked uh, the sailors that were g went around and exploring, so why is the p compass pointing that direction? What is it? Why is it, is, it, is it pointing that way? And the first ideas were that, well, maybe there is something in the stars. So since the stars were also used for navigation, maybe there is something magnetic up there. And, uh, we, well, after a while, it appeared clear that the stars was not a good idea. And one of the first to actually set up something that was at least uh, interesting was uh, Mercator, which is the, uh, uh, probably you know if you have a map and you see the Mercator projection, is the same person. And he thought that there was a giant magnetic mountain on the North Pole. Uh, the funny story here, I think, is that at very soon also the sailors that were very carefully navigating, they could see that actually, they could see two things. First, the, the uh, geographic north and the magnetic north, they were not exactly in line with each other. And also, depending where you were navigating, your magnet was actually pointing a bit in a different direction. So <laughs> Mercator said, well, then there must be two magnetic mountains, and he put two magnetic mountains in the, in the, in the map. So that's probably not the most uh, scientifically correct way of doing it, 
but the the idea w was interesting and uh, and at least very creative and sometimes as you will see in science you need some sort of crazy ideas to or to actually propose something new so that you of course then you need to test by experiments but that can allow you to go forward and to understand more and indeed this question where does the earth magnetic field come from is still kind of uh, it's not completely open question but we don't know the exact details yet and there is actually uh, so what we know is that the earth magnetic field looks something like this this is a picture uh, a bit of an artistic picture from the from the uh, NASA website but we know for example that the north magnetic pole and the geographic north pole are not exactly aligned with each other this is something that that uh, uh, that we know and we can measure very well and we also know that there is local deviations uh, of the magnetic field as you go around the earth what was discovered and this is really only a few months old i didn't know about these things when i was asked to give this lecture but i thought this is this is the way science works so there is new idea so i'll i'll, I'll tell i'll bring it forward is that apparently people using a satellite has been able to see a, a jet basically a, a flowing uh, a very fast flowing um, um, uh, iron river so molten iron that goes around the the earth in a sort of a cylinder so you can think that this, there is a cylinder from the north to the south pole and there is the this river of molten iron going around like this and this jet is believed that this actually could be the reason why we have uh, the magnetic field on the earth and uh, so this is, uh, as I said, it's been published a few months ago. I'm sure there will be some, some details coming up. But it could explain a lot of things that we were not able to understand until now. And I just bring this up because this is, a if you want, a magnetic river. And it's not too different, at least ideally, from a magnetic mountain. So it's, it's good to have uh, ideas. Then then you need to test, but to try to, to put forward suggestions how you explain things. Um, all right. And we will see that these uh, ideas, especially when uh, they came from a, a young generation of physicists, were key to actually allow us to understand magnetism. All right, so we go back to our map. So this was pretty easy. I mean, there's not much to tell here. So now we go, we jump forward 2,200 years, or well, uh, this is the span that we get. And we get to the year 1600, 1600. And why this number, is, this date is important? Well, there is uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the publication of, a very, of the first book, if you want, the first text, which actually tried to describe magnetism in, uh, in some details, and is uh, written by William Gilbert. Uh, I think he was British. And he wrote this book called De Magnete, and uh, is, there is a famous quote that is the core of the, of the book that says, Magnus Magnus Ipsus est Globus Terrestris. That is, sounds very fancy Latin. If you translate it in English, it just means the Earth itself is a giant magnet, which is <laughs> maybe not as as poetic. But but Gilbert has this idea that uh, he could he actually built something which he called a terella, so a small Earth, which was basically a small uh, magnet, which is a sphere, a spherical form. And he made a lot of experiments trying to understand many of the things that the Earth, the properties of the magnetic field in the Earth from this model. And uh, he got right a, a couple of things which were very important and were not clear at the time. That if you break a magnet in two, and this is, you know, it's from, from experience, that if you break a magnet in two, you have the north and the south pole. If you break it in two, you still have a north and a south pole. This is, uh, you could make it clear for, for everyone. And then there, that there is a difference. It was not clear that either, that between mind is and electricity. We will see that they are also related, but you can actually call something a magnetic phenomenon, something like electric phenomenon. What he got wrong is that he thought that the planets and the stars were interacting with magnetic forces. So this was a magnet that was keeping the moon and the sun and the earth all together. And Newton, 40 years later, actually showed this, this was gravity instead. But then, nevertheless, he was actually very uh, important in the history of magnetism. The key, I would say, it took 200 years more uh, to make the fundamental discovery, to completely change the way we, uh, we understand magnetism, how it all comes together. And this is, was, uh, uh, we, we have to give credit to a Danish physicist called Hans Christian Ørsted, and he did an experimental discovery that completely opened up for all the fundamental understanding of magnetism. And the... Uh, so what, what did he observe? I will not show you in the slides. We will redo the experiment here so that you will see uh, 
what the uh, what what was the effect. So what? Uh, let me show you here. So let's see if it works. Yes. So what I have here is a is a compass. Okay. Now uh, it's pointing in some direction. It doesn't really matter, but it's it's a real compass. I'm not, I can show you that if I take uh, a magnet and I point it towards it, it's, it will move. You see, I just get close and this will move it. Okay, so this is a, as a position which is decided by the Earth magnetic field. And Ersted think about a very simple experiment. He wanted to understand whether, you know, he read about this uh, the Gilbert uh, paper, like uh, electricity magnets are separated, but are they really? So it took a wire, and this is what I have here. This is a wire of copper. It's non-magnetic. So if I put it, close it, just close it to the uh, to the thing. It doesn't do anything to the uh, to the to the um, to the nail of the magnet. Let's see if I uh, yes, okay. But then it uh, it somehow managed. So it was the first years when you could have some sort of uh, the electricity. So it connected a battery to it, and it passed a current into the wire. And what I will do now, I will do the same experiment with much more advanced uh, 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 equipment, but it's the same thing. So I will turn on a current in this wire and see what happens. And if I do this, uh, you see that, uh, that the needle moves. And if I turn it off, it goes back where it was. And so and this, this was shocking for, for Erster because this was really, wow, then electricity and magnetism are related to each other then. So, and, I can and you can control it. Uh, so this was a really, uh, I must imagine when, when Ersted must have seen this, it was really uh, incredible. And then, uh, oh, I need to go back to the other screen. So soon, uh, so what did he observe in 1989 was the, the motion of, of a magnetic needle because of an electric current. And uh, a few years later, uh, some uh, French physicists, Biot, Savart, and then Ampère, they showed it actually how does this works in detail. So they figure out some of the mathematics behind, and they could show that if you have a, a, a wire that goes through a current, then you have a magnetic field that goes around it. And there is a lot of details. But the key point was really this one, that magnetism and electricity are related to each other. And it was a, a fundamental discovery for humanity, as we will see. And so the, this was very important. Then it took uh, a decade or two for the next big discovery. And this time was uh, a, a British physicist, uh, Michael Faraday. And he was probably the greatest experimentalist, one of the greatest experimentalists that ever was born and put foot on this planet. And uh, what he discovered in 1831 is that uh, you can actually have the opposite, the reciprocal effect of what Ersted discovered. So Ersted discovered that if you pass a current into a wire, you create a magnetic field. What the Faraday discovered is if you take a wire and you take a magnet and you move it around the wire, you create a current in the wire. So it's the opposite. And this is the, 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 the key, the fundamental discovery that allows our electricity to arrive at our homes nowadays. And the simple explanation is probably if you... Again, if you've ever seen this thing that uh, is on, on a bike, which is called a dynamo, uh, this is basically, uh, if you know how it works, you, you get this little head, uh, touch the wheel of your, bike, or of your bike, and then what happens is that your bike set in motion, the rotation of the bike set in motion this wheel. This wheel is connected to a magnet inside here that rotates, and the magnet is surrounded by wires. So the rotation of the magnet creates a current in the wires, and the current goes and power up the light of your bike. And this is the, the, the very same principle that is used to generate electricity from water, from wind, from gas. It's the same idea. So the water, the wind, or the gas makes a turbine rotate. And then this, the fact that it's magnetic and it's surrounded by wires create electricity that you can then take into the grid and take to your homes. So this was, uh, and there is a funny joke about this. I mean, apparently someone says that this is actually not Faraday said it, but it fits his personality. Uh, that when he showed this to the British uh, fin Minister of Finance, the British Minister, Minister of Finance said, so what is this good for? I mean, the light, the light bulb was not invented yet, so no one knew what to do with electricity. And Faraday apparently answered, I have no idea, but probably one day you'll be able to put a tax on it. 
And then uh, apparently Faraday was allowed to get, continue to get funding and continue his research. So he was a very clever uh, guy in, at many levels. Um, the second discovery that he made, so you, you would say, okay, this is enough for a life of discoveries, but Faraday was really, uh, it's impressive. And the second experiment is not as famous, uh, normally in the, in the, in the, or the, the applications are not as well known as, the, as this one, but is uh, probably even uh, more important for the history of, of physics and of magnetism. And what he discovered in 1845, that if you send the light through a piece of glass, and you put a magnetic field through it. So this is the uh, North Pole. This is actually from Faraday's own uh, uh, handwritten notes uh, that it was from the lab notebook. Uh, you can actually, so you have North Pole, South Pole, so you have a magnetic field that goes like this, and then you send light through this, and this is a piece of glass. And you notice that actually you can affect light with magnetism. And uh, this is, uh, uh, pretty, so it's, it's, I, I like re very much to read the text that, that you wrote. It says, but when the contrary magnetic poles were on the same side, there was an effect produced on the polarized ray, and thus, and thus magnetic force and light were proved to have relation to each other. And in the same style of the other quote, this fact will most likely prove exceedingly fertile and of great value. And uh, he was right, because this has been the demonstration that magnetism and light are related to each other. And since magnetism and, uh, is related also to electricity, and uh, magnetism is related to light, it means that magnetism, electricity, and light, they're all related to each other. And this was uh, extremely important to, uh, to, to figure out. I still don't understand, honestly, how he was able to do this experiment. I do this experiment in my lab. It's tricky to do it in 2017. He did it in 845. This is completely uh, beyond me understanding how he actually got this. But he was, uh, it actually was a self, um, he didn't go to school farther. So he learned all the things he knew by himself. He could do everything. He was chemist, physicist, and uh, well, it was, we have to be happy that uh, such an experiment has been around uh, for, for us. Uh, and the, but the, the really the, uh, the theoretical understanding of, of how we put all these pieces together, uh, it needed at least 20 years more. And again, was another uh, British uh, physicist, another very phenomenal person, this time a theoretician, which is uh, James Clark uh, Maxwell, which provided the theory where you could, we could unify uh, electricity, magnetism, and light. And what Maxwell did, he, he wrote what uh, the, uh, what we is now called as the, the famous four uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, which we don't need to go through in details, but I, I just want to show them because there is a value also in just see them written down. And those are these four. And uh, this is, I think what is impressive here, there's these four equations, they basically describe an incredible number of phenomena that uh, we see in our day life. The light, how, how is light is, is, uh, works in this room, these lights, how electricity is produced, how magnetism f works, and so on. This is all in these uh, equations. And this impressed people so much, uh, even physicists at the time, one of them was Boltzmann in Germany, that he thought that God r was, r was right in this equation, because those symbols look so esoteric also a bit. And uh, apparently this idea that somehow this equation that describes light among the things are uh, due to some divine entity is still apparently a very marketing, a successful marketing strategy because you can buy a t-shirt which says, and God said, and the four Maxwell equation, and then there was light. So this is the, <laughs> the physicist Bible, if you want. Okay, and so this was, this was really a majestic work. I mean, this is, this is still, I mean, if you study physicist 2017, uh, so you study as a physicist, so you study physics here, this is one of the fundamental courses to study, to learn how to derive and how to understand this, these equations. Okay, the next... <coughs> so, okay, so now we have unified magnetism. So we discovered that electric current gives us a magnetic field, that we can use a magnetic field to create current, that magnetic, uh, magnetism, electricity, and light are all connected together by this one. Uh, the, the prediction, there was one thing that happened here. It was not really clear that actually it was, 
that this was really describing light. So what one of the big uh, predictions that these equations made is that basically light is an electromagnetic wave and that there are a lot of types of electromagnetic waves. Not only light, that is the one that we can see, but also other types. So a, a German physicist uh, named Heinrich Hertz uh, discovers, decides to test this, uh, this theory. And in, uh, in, in doing this test, he discovers the uh, radio, wa radio waves. And what he did, he, did, he built a very uh, peculiar uh, device, which looks like this. So now it's, it's maybe not too easy to see, but basically had, this is what you would have now called a battery. So you had a source of energy. And then you have something which uh, is basically the antenna, uh, a very rudimental antenna. And what he, he could do, he could basically, in this antenna, create a spark. So it's an antenna which has a, almost two touching wires. And he was placing another antenna. So this is the antenna that generated the signal. And he placed another antenna uh, at some distance. And uh, what he figured out is that when the spark was created here, you could also see a spark here. So basically, he could see that there was something that was going through the air that he could not see, but he, he could see that the two antennas were talking to each other. And this was uh, uh, mysterious. And if you go and, and look at what he said when he made the discovery, there was a different character from Faraday. But he says, it's of no use whatsoever. This is just an experiment that proves Maestro Maxwell was right. We just have these mysterious electromagnetic waves that we cannot see with the naked eye, but they are there. And then, asked about the ramification of the discovery, Earth replied, nothing, I guess. And this is basically <laughs> the foundation of everything we use in radio, televisions, Wi-Fi, phones. Is, this is the, thanks to this. So uh, that's just to say that it doesn't mean that being you a very expert in, in something means that you have all, you're always right. Um, OK, so this is the, uh, uh, this was the, uh, the, let's say this was the, the, the final discovery. We were getting close to the 20th century. And at this point, so if you, if you remember history, this is the time where actually, um, you know, we started to have, uh, you know, the coal. I mean, there was a lot of uh, industries being built. So humanities feel, felt that we could do anything. So we, we could build uh, big machines. We could uh, we start to have electricity. You know, the things uh, there was, I think, is when the, it's around the period of positivism. So people think that we could do anything. We could achieve everything. And this is, uh, there was, of course, a reason for this, because all of a sudden, when we started to understand the things, we became way more technological. But when we look at the physics, and in, partic in general, and uh, magnetism in particular, there was still some problem. We still couldn't answer the questions. So we know how to use magnetism, but where does it come from? So we know how to describe it and you know, make a good use of it, but wh where, where does it come from? And uh, the second question is related to the first one, is why are certain materials magnetics while others are not? And this, it turns out that it was not uh, well, by, by chance that we could not answer this question. To answer this question, we needed one step more, which has been one of the greatest achievements of humanity, I think, is that the, the, being able to understand quantum mechanics and quantum physics. Because as, as I will show you, and this comes to the difficult part, so there is no way you can explain magnetism without quantum mechanics. And uh, so magnetism is, the first, is actually the first quantum physics uh, probably discovery that was, that was made in humanity without knowing uh, that. OK, so, so if we go back here, so, then, so now we, so we, we crossed this, this uh, long period with only use of magnets as, as, uh, as compasses. And then we get into the, we start with alignment, understanding magnetism. We start to build our first uh, electric engines and to use electricity in our society. And we start to use uh, radio waves to communicate without wires and communicate at a distance. So there is a lot, the humanity has gone uh, quite a lot forward in these years. Now we get to the last part, which is the modern times, where we uh, start to go into what we call now the information age, hmm? towards the, 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 this, the century and the years we live in. The, very the first important year that we need to, to remember is uh, 1921. 
And it was, again, an experimental discovery that was uh, very puzzling in the beginning. It turned out to be the key to understand uh, magnetism. And this was the experiment done by two German physicists named Stern and Gellack. And they made a very complicated experiment. Again, another experiment that is ununderstandable how they were able to do this almost 100 years ago. They, now, we don't need to go into the details, but what they did is they took a beam of atoms, these were silver atoms, they sent them, they sent them through a weird magnet. Uh, it doesn't matter the details, but basically the magnet deflects them. And, what, and then they put, basically they shoot the, the silver atoms on a screen that was here. And they, they looked, okay, what happened? And the, uh, there was two predictions. So one is that the, at the atoms are magnetic and they behave like a normal um, compass, if you want, so that they can orient in all possible directions. So if that was true, so the atoms coming in have all different possible orientation of, 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 of their, so the compass inside the atoms is pointing in all possible directions, and then you would see a line in the screen. What they, figure, what they found out instead is that they were not getting a light, they were getting two dots. As the, magnet, as the compass inside the magnet could only be stuck in the north or in the south. It's a pretty useless magnet if you want to use the navigation, it just tells you either you're going in the right direction or you're in the opposite, but it doesn't have any, any degree of, 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 uh, of precision. So it's either up or down. Or down. And they th thought actually that this was the proof that the atomic theory of Niels Bohr, which thought that it was the first proponent that the atoms are made of a nucleus and there are electrons going around in orbits. They thought that it was the proof that actually this model was right. And it turns out that both the interpretation and both the Bohr's model actually were wrong. But, but this was actually the first uh, experiment that showed that there's something we are going on with magnetism, at the, uh, really at the, at, the, at the fundamental level. And the, the explanation, the reason why it was wrong is that if uh, we don't need to go into the details, but if Bohr was right, they should have seen three spots. There's only two. So qu quite soon people start to ask, why is only two? So but they figure out that the interpretation explanation was, was not right. Um, so why only two? And then uh, there was two young uh, students, uh, Dutch, uh, two young uh, uh, Dutch physicists, they came up with a very, very interesting idea and this concept of spin. So they thought that not only, uh, let's say that even the Bohr models was right, that the, at the electrons are going around the, the nuclei. But in the same way as the Earth rotates around the Sun, the Earth also spin on itself. So what if the electrons do the same thing? So they rotate around the atoms, but actually uh, the, uh, they also rotate on themselves. And since their uh, electrons is made of a charge, there's a, a rotating charge, it's basically a rotating current, and this will give a magnetic uh, moment, a uh, magnetic north and south pole. And the assumption was that these electrons can only spin either this way or the other way. So the spin cannot be up or down. So, and that could explain the experiment of Stern and Gerlach. And it was interesting that they actually get the, pub the paper published, and they were apparently right. So this is still the way we think now. It was interesting that one of the cleverest, the most clever physicists of that time, which was name was Pauli, you may have heard of Pauli exclusion principle, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for this, uh, heard about the concept of the spins, and actually there is a letter from one of some few physicists that says, I think you and Uhlenbeck have been very lucky to get your spinning electron published and talk about before Pauli heard of it. It appears that more than a year ago, Koenig believed in the spinning electron and worked out something. The first person he showed it to was Pauli. Pauli ridiculed the whole thing so much that the first person became also the last. And no one else heard anything of it, <laughs> which all goes to show that the infallibility of the deity does not extend to his self-styled vicar on Earth. Because Pauli was believed to be some sort of god on Earth when it came to physics. And he got this completely wrong. The, the not so funny story for them is that he won the Nobel Prize, Pauli, for uh, among other things, the exclusion principle, which is heavily based on the, on the concept of spin. These two guys didn't get anything. But uh, so this is, this is again, so uh, sometimes science goes into uh, strange directions, but it was very good that somehow Pauli wasn't there and listening and being the referee of the paper where these guys published the spinning electrons. It may have taken much more longer 
to come out to the uh, to this understand. Okay, so so now we have so and this was apparently believed to be the, the building block of magnetism. So now we have this this building block of magnetism, but then we still don't understand why are certain mag uh, materials magnetic and something some some others are not. And this uh, needed an extra step, and it was really the, the key and the, and, the, and the part of the theory, of the quantum mechanical theory that, that was needed to, to, to explain this. And it was due to uh, Heisenberg, uh, who also won a Nobel Prize, uh, that, that provided a theory that explains why, in magnetic materials, spins wants to align to each other. So he proposed that basically, in a, in a magnetic material, like in, a, in a, one of the strong magnets you can buy, all the spins are parallel to each other. So all the electrons are spinning together the same way. So this is basically magnifies the effect. So if you take a magnet and now all the spins are spinning together, then at the distance you can feel the effect of the spinning electrons. In a, no, in a, in a material where this is not happening, where the, they're not all dense or they're not spin in tune, then this effect is not there and the material is non-magnetic. So, and the fundamental reason, and this is the thing that uh, if you're a student in physics, if you have a background in physics, you can understand. If not, well, either come study physics or, <laughs> or accept this very uh, strange idea, is that this is a pure quantum mechanical effect, which we call the exchange interaction. And it's actually an electric force, it's non-magnetic, that causes two spins to, to become parallel to each other. So the two spins talk to each other, but not via the magnetic field that they create, but via a something that's called the exchange interaction. And this exchange interaction is not something that you have experienced in your normal life. This is only something that happens to electrons in atoms. As soon as we go to the world where we, are, we can experience, this is becomes uh, not something that we can experience. And it turns out... So, but then why, why some, so if the ex interaction wants to put everything parallel, why there are only few uh, magnetic materials? The reason is that this exchange interaction uh, is, has a different strength depending on the material. And it actually, if you, and it has to go against another energy, which is the thermal energy, so temperature. So if you heat up things, they, they, your, your warmth wants to, uh, put this order. You want to put the spins uh, all over uh, the place. And this, this exchange interaction wants to put them parallel. So it's a continuous fight between the exchange interaction wants to keep them parallel and the temperature wants to put them uh, randomly. And it turns out that so if you cool, so if you take the temperature very low, if you go to zero Kelvin, almost everything is magnetic. So every, every, almost a, any element becomes magnetic. But if you start to raise the temperature and you get to room temperature, then only three elements remain magnetic, and this is iron, cobalt, and nickel. And this is what we call the ferromagnet, or magnets. And this is still what we, uh, what we use. If we should warm up the temperature even more, then also they would lose the magnetism. So this is really, it's, it's, it's uh, just a chance that this is, those are the three that survives. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the first to lose the magnetization would be nickel, and cobalt, and iron. Iron is the one that would survive the longest at the high temperature. And the reason, so and I indeed, see this is uh, the, the elements that used to build this, for example, these very strong magnets that you can buy now, for example, the so-called neodymium magnets. Uh, the word neodymium makes you think that those are made only of neodymium. Actually, most of it is iron. Uh, the details why neodymium make them so strong, it's, it's a bit too complicated to go into now. But those, all the magnets you can buy is either iron, cobalt, or nickel. And so, and those, the... Uh, the applications of every magnets which become stronger and stronger is very important because if you have a stronger and stronger magnet, you can make it smaller and smaller. So the reason why we can have very compact uh, Wi-Fi devices or uh, uh, more efficient uh, electric generators is because our, the magnet technology has improved so much that now we can do the same things we could do 20 years ago with a much bigger uh, magnet. And so this is, this is for the, say, bulk applications. The, the really, the, 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 a lot of the research into magnetism in the last 20 years has gone into uh, making uh, hard disk drives, uh, which basically are really disk. They, I mean, this I open on a hard disk drive. This is the disk, how it looks like. So this is the, the piece here. And those is, this is where the information gets stored. Uh, this is a, you could think this is an old record that used to play music. There are tracks here. Now, in this case, the tracks are not 
uh, like physical tracks, those are magnetic tracks. And here you can see this is what is your read ahead and also write ahead for, for, because we can both read and write information. And the way it works, if you could zoom in very much into this disk, is to the, this here, is that you would see these magnetic tracks and you could see that uh, you would see a lot of uh, south and north, south, north, south, north poles pointing up. And uh, these north and south poles uh, create a magnetic field, and these magnetic fields that you can measure is the way you read information. So here you can read, let's say, if you call the north is, is a one, then it's a wide north uh, uh, part of the track, so this is a one, one, and then you have a zero and one, and so on. If you want to write information, then what you do, you take a stronger magnet and you can actually flip one of those uh, tracks. So, but this is the way the absolute majority of the information in the, uh, in the, on the planet is stored. Y you may say, yeah, but if you buy a laptop, now we have the solid state drives and it's true. But if you really have to save a lot of information, like for example, when you watch a movie from Netflix or, from, or you listen to music from Spotify, the amount of information is in there so large that having solid state drive would be too expensive. This is still too cheap and too reliable to be substituted. So somewhere in, in Sweden or the US, there is a big data center with a lot of hard drives stacked into where all the information, all your pictures, when you save them and you put them on the cloud, end up being. And they're stored in, the, in this form. OK, so we're almost at the end. So I, we talked, so this is, the, the trip, the time travel that we made. So we went through something we could call the exploration age, then we went to the industrial age and the information age, if you want. And this corresponded to three distinct periods of time where we understood different things about magnetism. So let's give you two things about the future. This is what has been in the past. Uh, so let's do a couple of minutes talking about the futures. What were we doing with magnetism now? So there is a lot of subfields within magnetism. One of the subfields, which is, uh, there are couples which are very, we say hot in, in, the, <laughs> in, in the community, so that are very active. There is a lot of people working on them. One is so-called ultra-fast magnetism, and that's the idea that it somehow follows Faraday experiment when he sent the light, and he saw and noticed that the light was affected uh, by, by magnetism. Now we try to do the opposite. Uh, we try to use light to control magnetism. And the idea is that we, w we want to be able to write and read information a thousand times faster than what you can do now. And also, since we are in an age where we need to be careful about how much energy we consume, this will be much, much more efficient than doing it traditional way. So this would be uh, one way. So, and this is, so this would be the cartoon where you have a laser, a very fast laser that writes your north and south poles on some magnetic material. And this is what my research particularly is about now at, at Physicum. And uh, the other trend, which is also very, uh, uh, very interesting nowadays, is the idea of using, doing quantum computing using spins. I don't do this particularly myself, but the idea again here is to use these spins, very few of them, to actually let them interact and do some sort of calculations that you cannot do with a normal computer, but you can do with a quantum computer. And here at Physicum, we both have experimentalists and theoreticians working on, on this topic. Okay, uh, I think that was pretty much it. I hope you, you, you see what we started from the magnets that they had a soul, and to the idea now that we arrived at you know, this, this magnet has to do with some sort of uh, spinning uh, electron. So an electron is rotating on itself. To me, w one of the things that is still most fascinating, and when I discuss to non-physicists, and apparently is also uh, very fascinating, is that to think that all the information of, of that we have in the world, uh, all the, the videos we make, all the pictures we take, all the music we listen to, is basically stored somewhere in the form of a, of a lot of, of very many spinning electrons. So there is this billions and billions of electrons spinning around, keeping our memory alive, which is kind of make you a bit crazy if you think too much about it. Uh, but all right, I want to finish very, very with a timely and ironic uh, quote by one of the greatest physicists, I think, of the previous century, which is Richard Feynman, which, which said, is no one inspired by our present picture of the universe? 
This value of science remains unsung by singers. You're reduced to hearing not a song or a poem, but an, even, an, evening, an evening lectures about it. This is not yet a scientific age. Waiting for uh, more scientific times, I hope you anyhow enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Tack så mycket Stefano. Tack. Um, innan jag glömmer det ska jag säga att ni har, har märkt kanske att vi filmar här ikväll. Och eh, om ni vill se den här föreläsningen någon gång nästa vecka eller tidigare för den här på. Bra. Um, så kan ni gå till vår Youtube-kanal som finns en länk till den från hemsidan fysik.su.se. Där finns det lite gamla öppna föreläsningar om relativitetsteori och kosmologi och eh, lite om, jag tror det finns en om quantum computing också. Mm, just det. Men eh, om någon har några frågor de vill ställa till Stefan och så är ni välkomna nu. Mm. Tesla, uh, so the question is where uh, did Nikolai Tesla came in? So I, I actually was debating whether to put him in or not. But Tesla is actually, it's uh, around the 1900. It's uh, around there, like uh, at, the, at that gap. And what he did actually, so the idea of Faraday, this electric induction was very primitive. The way it actually was worked and the device that we use now are the ones that actually Tesla uh, devices. It was Edison that thought we would use direct current to power the electrical grid. And, Nico and Tesla said, no, we should actually use the alternate current, which is much better to transport a distance. So he, dev he devised a scheme actually how to make it work. And it was right at the crossing of the century. Uh, yeah. Thank you. It was a good question. Unfortunately, you have to select <laughs> the people you put in. It was Italian after all. Sorry? No, it, it was, was Croatian. Ah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> or Serbia Croatian. Yeah. Nikolai. Okay, more questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so there is, uh, there is an interest, so this is an interesting point, I'm not an expert in this, but uh, this is the same, is, I, I believe, I don't know about this, but it's the same thing that happens in the earth. So the earth, in the, the iron inside the earth is, is, is liquid, it's not magnetic. So it's not the iron itself that creates the magnetic field, it's the fact that you have a, a basically a hot me, ma, uh, metallic mass rotating, this creates a current. So, and this can create a current in, into outside. The stars actually, honestly, I have to admit my ignorance of whether there is another phenomenon that drives this. But th there could be, even if things are very hot, you could still have some, some other process that causes the magnetic field. That definitely is not this type of magnetism. Thank you. Fler frågor? Det går bra att ställa på svenska om man vill också. Där har vi en fråga. Mm -hmm. Can it from a four? Oh, okay, so the question is, I, I translate just to make, <laughs> if there is someone else. So the magnetic field is a field, can you draw it uh, in form of a shape? That's, that's the question. Uh, I think this can go into the philosophy. So, <laughs> uh, so the, the thing is that the idea of field is something that came in relatively uh, late. I, I mean, it's actually a pretty, to talk about field is pretty something pretty modern. It's something that uh, was one of the hard things for Maxwell to discuss, was actually this idea of field. What is it? And so I think we, I mean, the field, the, the, the problem is that the, the idea when you do a, an experiment is that you, you can always probe the field. So the idea is that you make a measurement of the field in different points, assuming that your measurement doesn't disturb the field, then you can actually measure it. So in a way, yes, you can. Uh, it, the idea is that you're always able to make a measurement that is subtle enough that doesn't disturb the field so that you can somehow represent it with some sort of lines. The lines are because a magnetic field is so-called a vector field, so it has a direction. So that's what, when one uh, draws these arrows, is because it, it indicates where the field is pointing. So in this way, you, you can uh, draw it, if you want. Okej, okay, fler frågor? Yeah. Ska han ha en hård 
Okej, okay, så du, okay, du frågar om, om man skulle få den här att stanna en, en spinnande elektron, eller? Ja. Ja. So the question is that how long would the information be retained in a hard drive? That's actually one of the fascinating things. So hard drives are tested for 20 years. So if you take an hard drive, you leave it there. And I mean, it doesn't break mechanically. But the, the information is actually tested, they guarantee 20 years. That's why actually it's used. Actually, I, have, I mean, there is a hard drive that actually resisted longer than that. But that's the fascinating thing, that without putting any energy, you keep the things going. And this is really only quantum mechanics that can explain this, because otherwise the energy should go somewhere. But this is, a, is a f the lowest energy level that you can have, these spinning electrons. And this stays there forever in principle. What is actually... Uh, destroyed is the temperature, and uh, o over a certain time, some of them flips, and after 20 years, so many of them has flipped that basically there is no information. But 20 years is a good number, so it's very long. Okay, have a number till. Yes. Okay, I translate, this is probably one of the most difficult questions, but it's a very good one. So, yes, the, 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 it exists in magnetite and hematite, and they're both is an iron with oxide. Why one is magnetic and the other is not? This is a good point, because yesterday I went to one of these stores that sends magic stones, and I went to get magnetite, and I only got hematite. And <laughs> the reason is actually, uh, this is actually a very tricky uh, ex uh, reason why this is also, I don't know if you know, but it's magnetic and non-magnetic steels. Uh, you can buy um, uh, uh, so if you have an induction stove, some of the pots you put in, some of them t works and some not. And the reasons actually has to do with the crystalline structure of, I of, of, of the material. So if iron can form two different structures, the atoms can arrange in two different modes. One of them is magnetic, the other is not. And this is uh, why is that this is, if you want to show this, theoretically, it's extremely complicated. But it has to do with how the atoms arrange each other. You can think that in one arrangement, they cancel each other. The magnetics cancel each other. In the other, actually, it helps each other. So there's the magnetite. Uh, this is the hematite. Okay. Anyone more who wants to ask something? What Okay, so the, sorry. <laughs> the question is, if you, so there is very strong magnetic fields you can lift, like uh, uh, cars and everything, and if you stay close by, how is this, it is effective? Uh, so, of course, if you have electronic stuff, don't go close to a, a big magnet, it will destroy them. So our bodies are actually uh, not too sensitive to, to magnetic fields. So you can actually can stay close to a very strong magnetic field and not much will happen to uh, basically nothing. And we use this actually uh, in MRI, uh, in Swedish it's called magnetic röntgen, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, to actually take picture of yourself. You actually put your body into a very strong magnet and you take a picture. Uh, what can help you if you are over a strong magnet, if there is another, uh, say, say, a piece of iron between you and the strong magnets. The iron will take most of the magnetic field, and you will be kind of protected. But if you have a very, if you have a mobile phone and you put it very close to um, a very strong magnetic field, you can actually can damage it. So don't get too close in this case. And don't go too close if you have a pacemaker. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Any other questions? The follow up. E what's that? EMP? F Philip Papa. Aha, på vilket sätt? Det var undrar du. Okay. Yeah, they, uh, okay, first of all, so the, the question is, what's, uh, what's the difference between an electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic pulse and a, a magnet? Uh, so a magnet is something that uh, you can have, well, you can buy, it's something like this. So and this is what you get from a magnetic field. For an electromagnetic pulse, what, what you do is basically, 
it's the same difference there is between this and a uh, light. An electromagnetic pulse is actually uh, something which is both magnetic and electric. And you can create, for example, with an antenna or with a, um, with a yes, well, let's say with a, with a current uh, generator. So basically, it's not uh, something that you get out of a static magnet, but it's something that you... Uh, can create when you create a wave. So an electromagnetic pulse is a wave, let's put it like this. Uh, it's a light, if you want, a, uh, if you shine the light of a laser for a second, that's an electromagnetic pulse. And that's something that, that travels. While this one is something that is, w this is sometimes called a uh, magnetostatic effect. While the electromagnetic pulse is dynamics, because you create this pulse and this propagates. This is a kind of a, a radio wave. That's an electromagnetic pulse. I don't know if it's made it clear, but... Okay. Um, någon mer som vill ställa en fråga? Okay. Low, uh, enough temperature, all materials get... Almost. 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 Uh, at, at what temperature do you mean? Is it uh, very close to... Zero zero uh, so if you want to have most of them zero Kelvin, yes. Uh, there is, so if you just go below the room temperature, there is a fourth magnet, which is gadolinium, just right below. So if you get like 10 Celsius, you will get another extra element. But otherwise, it's, uh, the, more, so the more you go down, the more they pop up. So basically, there is, there is uh, I mean, there is not one temperature where everything becomes magnetic. It's more and more as you go down. And the, sorry. Right, so one, one thing, so this is a very good point. I didn't tell you all the truth. So in order to make something magnetic and properly with a proper orientation, you need, while you cool this down, you need to have another magnet close by. So if you just cool it down and there was a disorder before, it, it will basically freeze the disorder. But if, while you do this, you put let's, one of these magnets close to it, then the thing will become magnetic. So the magnetic field of this one will tell, it will tell one of the spins, point this direction, and all, all the others will follow. But if you don't have this, there is no line to follow. So this is the way they do it. They just simply don't put a magnet. And this is actually the way you make a magnet. So you warm up the iron or whatever material until it's, more, it's not magnetic anymore. Then you put another magnet close by, and then you start to cool it down with the field on. And then when you remove it, this also the other one is magnetic. So that's the way you actually make a magnet. So it's a very good question, but <laughs> there is a, uh, some details to it. Yeah. And uh, sorry, the, the, the materials that are not become magnetic are the noble gases, because they are the, all electrons are paired up. So they are not magnetic, but most of the others <coughs> are, actually. Yeah. This is, this is very fascinating, and this discovery that it was a few months old may actually explain this. What they saw, when they saw this river rotating, is actually the speed and the amplitude of the river is changing. So it could be of this magnetic river or this iron river going down. So one of the suggestions of the paper is actually this could actually, this is accelerating, at some point it could break, and then it goes the other way. And when it flips the sign of rotation, the magnetic field could flip. And this is, I think, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I think it's the first time that this model is, is put forward. Otherwise, this is one of the mysteries why this thing is flipping. Uh, but it, of course, it takes 10,000, hundreds of thousands of years to this to happen. So they see a very, very slow change, and they think maybe in thousands of years or 100,000, we will see this. But uh, this is so new that <laughs> no one really knows. Om det inte är några fler frågor tycker jag vi tackar Stefano en gång till. Tack.